Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to RTDology, Burns Engineering's online training series. I'm Jeff Wiggin, National Sales Manager here at Burns Engineering, and presenting today will be Bill Burquist, our Senior Application Engineer. Today's presentation, Selection and Application, How to Choose an RTD with Confidence, is part of our series of web-based training modules designed to help you better understand temperature measurement and achieve your measurement goals. If you've joined us for any of our previous previous sessions, welcome back. If this is your first time, welcome. And when you get a chance, do check out our previous presentations at our YouTube page. Um, it is under RTDology. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we will make an effort to uh, limit the presentation and Q&A period to one hour. We do highly encourage questions, so please type them into the Q&A section or the chat box on your screen and send them to host and presenter. Today's session is being recorded, and uh, we will provide a link to the uh, YouTube uh, page as soon as it is done. So don't worry if you miss something, you'll uh, have a chance to review it. If we don't get to your questions or you need some additional assistance, there will be contact information at the end of the presentation. And finally, our goal is to answer your temperature measurement questions and challenges. We've built our RTDology series around commonly asked questions and issues. However, if you have a particular topic you'd like to have considered, give us a call and we'll see what we can put together for you. So that covers the housekeeping. So without further delay, here is Bill Burquist to help us better understand selection and application, how to choose an RTD with confidence. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, today we're gonna go through and look at the um, there's kind of five different areas that we'll look at. We'll look at placement, how to protect the sensor, the performance. We'll look at the price and service life. Uh, yeah, I could hear. So, um, so first off, um, I want to just set up kind of a, a typical application. We'll be looking at a temperature measurement in a pipe that uh, there's a liquid flowing through it. And then we'll get into all the details on how we choose an RTD and all the different factors that we need to consider in choosing the correct one to get a good, accurate temperature measurement. So we have a liquid flowing in a pipe. It's a four inch pipe. so you know, fairly small, 50 feet per second. Temperature, we're heating it up to 150 Fahrenheit. Uh, very little vibration going on. Uh, there is an explosive gas present around the pipe occasionally, so we'll need to take that into consideration. Uh, we've got a three quarter NPT female process connection, and we wanna be able to measure the temperature of this fluid within plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit. So that's going to be just a little bit of a challenge. Um, so what I want you to kind of come away f with today from this presentation is just kind of the basics on what we need to look at to, s to make a good choice for an RTD in a typical application like this. Um, one of the best ways, kind of a little memory trick, is just to remember these four Ps. So we've got placement, protection, performance, price, and then service life. And we'll just step through each one of these and look at all the different factors that uh, go into determining which sensor to choose here. First off, we have two options as far as placing the sensor in the process. We can mount a sensor on the surface of the pipe and try to measure the temperature of the fluid that way. Or we can drill a hole in the pipe and immerse a sensor in it and measure temperature that way. Surface mount uh, is usually just a uh, small temperature sensor. It could be a square block like this one, or it could be a cylindrical one. There's lots of different styles like this. It's just clamped to the outside of the pipe, and it measures the temperature of the uh, pipe and not actually the fluid. They're really easy to install. We're not obstructing the flow. Typically very low cost. So. Uh, if you don't need a real accurate measurement, you may want to consider this as a solution. In our case, though, we need better than one degree Fahrenheit, so surface mount really isn't going to work very well. 
If we insulate around the outside of the sensor, we get a little better temperature reading. And what the insulation does is just shield the sensor from the ambient temperature conditions. If we don't do that, the sensor is going to uh, actually be reading part of the ambient conditions rather than the pipe wall temperature. Most of these are in some form or another that's not really conducive to measuring in a typical calibration hot block, for example. Uh, and even in some liquid baths, they may be difficult to calibrate. Now, if we look at some of the Im immersion styles, we can go direct immersion, with typically just a quarter inch or three eighths inch diameter probe screwed directly into the uh, piping. Or there's a thermal well applications, a couple different options of those. If we look at direct immersion, we get a good fast response time. Again, fairly low cost. And we can get by with a pretty short immersion length. You know, we have a four inch pipe here uh, with most direct immersion sensors. You know, you need probably you know, anywhere from two to four inches of immersion to get a good, accurate measurement. Some of the limitations with these, though, if if you have a fast flow rate like we do here, which is about 50 feet per second, that can actually cause that probe to vibrate or bend or even break off. So durability, strength uh, are possible issues there. And the last one is maintenance. When it comes time to calibrate the sensor or to replace it, we need to drain the line, and then you can pull the sensor out and put in the new one and then start the process up again. In some instances, that may not be very desirable. Now, for our application here, we're going to pick a, a, a thermal well, because that's going to give us the, the uh, durability that we need. Maintenance is going to be much easier. It's going to provide more protection for the sensor that we place in it and it's got the strength to survive the high flow rate. Just a couple limitations there. We've got a slower response time in our application here. We're not too concerned about that. This is a steady state flow and it doesn't really change much. So we can get by with the slower response time. Immersion lengths typically need to be longer than a direct immersion sensor. And we'll look at some more details of that a little later here. Um, now that we've we've looked at the direct immersion sensor, we've looked at a thermal well application, uh, we need to also protect the sensor on the outside of the pipe. So we've got the thermal well protecting it on the inside. And we need to look at the 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 instrument side of this where we might use a connection head. We need to consider our hazardous environment. Um, and then we'll take a closer look at some of the maintenance considerations. First, though, I want to go talk about the thermal well and how we protect the thermal well from the process conditions. Now, there's some very important factors to consider here. The, the, the biggest one I put on the bottom of the list, which is wake frequency and strength. That's probably the most important one uh, as far as long-term survivability of the thermal well in that process. Um, the other things that are maybe a little more evident would be the connection style, what pressure it has to, to uh, withstand, the temperature that we're measuring, corrosion and erosion, and then drag and then whatever vibration may be present. Process connections take form of, you know, flanges weld in, threaded connections. Uh, there's some specialty ones like this with the O-ring on it, which are typically used in bioreactors. Um, there's also, uh, you know, compression fittings and pretty much any other kind of connection you can think of. But these are just some of the more common ones that I've shown here. And then we need to make sure that our fluid in our pipe is not going to corrode the thermal well. You know, if we're trying to measure water temperature and we put a just a regular mild steel thermal well in, it, eventually it's going to 
start to rust and cause some problems. Uh, on the other end of the scale, if we're pumping acid through a pipeline, we might want to look at using some sort of a, a plastic thermal well that can withstand the, the acid environment. What we've got here is just an excerpt from a corrosive materials table. Uh, these are pretty easy to find on the internet if you uh, just, uh, um, you know, you can Google thermal well corrosive material table and you'll come up with a half a dozen different ones. And they cover pretty much anything you can imagine. They typically have the corrodent and then the uh, temperature concentration that it's in and then a recommended material for the thermal well. Now, in addition to corrosion, erosion can be a big factor. When we have, um, oh, I, I can think of one application where a customer was making the granules for asphalt shingles, and they're blowing these through a pipe, and they're trying to measure that with a thermocouple in, inside of a thermal well. And after about a month or two of that, the temperature reading went away. They pulled the well out and half of the well was gone. It had just completely disintegrated from that erosion. The solution there was to go in and add a stellite coating to the well and then put that thermal well on a periodic replacement schedule. The stellite slowed down the corrosion quite a bit so they could get by with uh, you know, probably 12 months, 12 to 18 months of service out of it before they had to go and replace it. Uh, other materials like tungsten carbide are even harder than stellite. Um, some processes, alumina might be a good choice. And there are several others, but these are just, uh, stellite's probably one of the more common ones. So we talked a little bit about immersion length. Uh, we need to balance that against a safe flow velocity. So whenever we have a cylindrical object placed in a flow, there's going to be the possibility that uh, a, these little vortices will form downstream of the thermal well, and these vortices oscillate back and forth. It's like a little turbulence forming downstream of the well, and they oscillate back and forth. And if they do that at the same frequency that matches a resonant frequency of the well, it's going to start to vibrate and fail quite quickly. So we need to balance the immersion length of the sensor versus the safe flow velocity. Now this graph shows a quarter inch diameter direct immersion sensor. We've got about, oh, maybe 30 to 40 feet per second of a safe flow velocity at a four inch immersion. If we jump up with that same four inch immersion in a thermal well that has a three quarter inch NPT threaded connection on it, that bumps up our safe flow velocity to about 250 feet per second. So quite a difference between the two. Uh, very important to make sure that the thermal well is designed to survive in the flow, whether it's a, a liquid flow, or uh, steam or any kind of uh, you know natural gas or any kind of vapor, it's real important to have the uh, some mathematical calculations done to ensure that that well is suitable for that particular flow velocity. Now, other ways to protect the outside of the sensor here, we need to we had this explosive gas surrounding the well, or surrounding our temperature measurement point. Uh, we're going to look at the connection heads and the extension which connects the head to the thermal well and, and houses the sensor, and also some of the agency approvals that are available for explosive atmospheres. And Jeff, I'm assuming you're going to jump in here anytime if we have any questions or whatever. So I Yep. Absolutely, and it's a great time uh, to just remind folks, if you do have any questions as uh, as we go along, go ahead and type them into the Q&A section or the chat section, and we'll go ahead and try to answer those kind of on the, on the fly here and get you an answer just as quickly as possible. Okay. 
Yeah, so we're moving along pretty quick here, but if you do have questions, you know, don't hesitate to interrupt us and, and we'll get to those right away. First off, connection heads uh, makes a good place to attach your extension wires from your facility. It typically would be a terminal block inside, and it also protects the sensor from the ambient conditions. Most RTDs have lead wires that are potted in epoxy in the back, you know, right where they exit the probe. And that works really well for uh, just humidity um, in the room up to, you know, 99%. But if you get liquid water on that area, it eventually is going to make its way inside the probe and cause a measurement error. So we want to make sure we protect that side of the sensor with a connection head or some kind of an enclosure. And these come in all different materials. There's cast iron, aluminum, polypropylene, polycarbonate, stainless steel, um, lots of different options there, lots of different sizes. And there's usually one that will fit in with your app, particular application. They also make a really good place to mount a transmitter, um, or if you need a local indication of the temperature, another good way to, to accomplish that is just to uh, choose a connection head that has the indicator as an option. Now our hazardous atmosphere is going to require a rating. We're going to use this uh, factory mutual rating. This particular connection head shows that it's a class one, division one, group A, B, C, D. And the uh, class one, div one, group A, for example, would mean that there's an acetylene atmosphere, which is the most explosive, uh, and it's present all the time. And these other classes and divisions mean that the Hazardous material can be there part of the time, or uh, could be a dust, gas, anything. It's just a whole alphabet soup of numbers and letters that define where that connection head and assembly can be used. Um, and you'll notice some of these will have this other note on it that says use a seal within 18 inches of connection head. Well, that means that you need to seal the conduit uh, that you're running to the head just so that that gas can escape into the conduit. Now for attaching the head to the well, there's a few different options. We've got just this plain old pipe nipple and then a pipe nipple and a coupling and then there's the pipe union. And the union is probably the most versatile of all of these. Uh, it, it makes removing the sensor for calibration replacement very easy. This, um, in, in addition to calibration or replacement, uh, it really makes it easy to orient the conduit opening on the connection head in whatever direction you need it. You just loosen this nut here and you can rotate it and then tighten it back up to lock it in place. Um, so that, that's a Pretty inexpensive, very convenient way to handle this. One of the other things that this extension accomplishes is it moves the connection head away from the heated process so that you don't overheat whatever electronics might be in there. So if you had a transmitter inside the connection head, for example, uh, most of those can handle about 80 or maybe 85 degrees C, but there's also a, an error associated with exposing electronics to an elevated temperature. So you want to keep the head as cool as you can, keep it right around 20 degrees C. That's where most electronics perform their best. And usually three inches is enough length to ensure that that does occur. So, uh, Bill, just a, a question kind of in, in terms of what we were ta talking about. Um, there's a question as to is this, is this what's referred to as lag or uh, maybe you want to just talk a little bit about uh, the lag length on, on thermal wells? Actually, no. The, the data sheets for instrumentation define this as an N dimension. 
and it's typically three inches is kind of an industry standard. A leg is actually this hex on the well is extended and that uses the variable letter T to designate the lag extension. So you can have this three inch nipple union plus a lag extension of, they're usually in like half inch increments. Um, so that would be in addition to the, the nipple union extension. And, and usually where we see uh, extended lags is when there's insulation around a pipe and they still want those wrench flats to be above the insulation so that they can, they, you know, so that you, it can be removed easily. So that's really the, um, you know, typically where the, where the lag comes in. And I see another question there that talks about the short immersion length and that's right where we're going right now because that is a big problem. We've only got two and a half inches of immersion on our thermal well that we selected and that is gonna give us a pretty decent uh, stem conduction error. So we can look at two different categories of error sources here. We've got a, the sensor accuracy where we've got interchangeability, um, we've got repeatability. There's a whole bunch of other kind of minor error sources that come into play. Uh, we're just gonna look at some of the bigger ones here. Uh, but if you wanna do a complete uh, you know, kind of uncertainty analysis of that measurement. Uh, we'd, we'd look at self-heating, um, probably uh, uh, hysteresis. Um, uh, there's like probably a half a dozen altogether. Uh, but I don't, I'm not gonna get into that today in that much detail. We're just gonna look at the big, kind of the big picture here and, and just kind of raise awareness that you can't just go grab a sensor off the shelf and say that it's a, you know, a class A sensor and it's got 0.13 degrees C accuracy and away you go. That's, uh, that's only part of the story. So but we look at the sensor accuracy, but we also look at the measurement accuracy and how it's affected by the installation. The biggest one here is gonna be that stem conduction. Uh, there's some other things like time response if you're uh, that can be a fairly significant error. We have to take into account the control system. We want it repeatable. And again, there's a lot of other small error sources. First off, sensor interchangeability. Now, this is the tolerance band that the RTD manufacturers apply to the sensor when they make it. So they try to adjust it as close as they can to 100 ohms at zero degrees C. Unfortunately, you know, it can't be done exact every time. So there's a tolerance band associated with it. And a couple of the, the, the two main standards for RTDs are the ASTM and the IEC. And both of those have just a little bit different um, tolerance bands associated with them. And these equations will, will let you calculate what that interchangeability is at any given temperature. So for example, if we look at this IEC class A, we would take 0 0.002 and multiply it by our temperature that we're interested in and, and this is the absolute value of the temperature. So if it's a negative temperature, we just drop the minus sign. So we got 0 0.002 times like say 150 degrees C, add 0.15. That gives you your interchangeability. So it'll be plus or minus so many degrees C. There's also some lookup tables. Uh, you can pick out your sensor interchangeability value that the manufacturer has selected. This one uses rather than the 0.06 and the 0.12 that the standards use. These are a little bit tighter. Uh, so right at zero degrees C, we're 0.14 degrees C. And as you get up in temperature, um, you know, 400 C, we're at uh, a degree. And if we have a standard or a I guess it would be a class B sensor. Even at 200 degrees C, we're already at plus or minus one degree C. Uh, 
Now, we, stem conduction can be a fairly significant error source. We have a hot fluid running through a pipe. We've got, you know, 20, 25 degrees C ambient conditions. And there's going to be a little bit of a cooling effect on that sensing element. Uh, this heat conducts along not only the thermal well and the connection head and, and all of that, but also the lead wires that run down to the sensor and they're intimately connected to the little coil of platinum wire inside. So if we don't have sufficient immersion, we're, we're going to get a measurement error. And if we look at uh, like a direct immersion sensor to overcome that stem conduction error, we have a little rule of thumb, which works for most applications in liquids. So it's 10 times the probe diameter plus the sensitive length of the probe. Most temperature sensors have a one inch sensitive length. They're quarter inch diameter. We do the math and we get three and a half inches as a minimum immersion. And that will eliminate, uh, you know, 98 plus percent of that stem conduction error. So in our application, we have a thermal well and we've got two and a half inches of immersion. And on this graph, the error is expressed as a percentage of the delta T. So it's a percentage of that difference in temperature between the process fluid and the ambient temperature. And on the horizontal axis here, we've got the immersion length for the thermal well. If we pick out two and a half inches and come over here, we can we can see, and if you expand this graph a little bit, we come up with about 1.6 Fahrenheit of an immersion error. In our process, we want it better than one degree Fahrenheit. So we have a little bit of an issue here. Um, even without looking at the sensor accuracy or anything else, we're already way over our accuracy budget for this measurement. And one of the big reasons why we want to make sure that we have a good accurate measurement it boils down to money. And if we have an inaccurate measurement, uh, it can be very costly as our little example shows here. Uh, $1,100 a year, and that's year after year. And this is a fairly, you know, mundane process, just 10 gallons per minute through a pipe. We're trying to heat it up, you know, from typical uh, city water temperature, for example. So it's only heating it up maybe 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So that can get to be a pretty big number. So it really pays to pay attention to how the sensor is installed, make sure you pick a good quality sensor, uh, get it as accurate as you can possibly get it. And if it costs a few hundred dollars to do that, that's usually a really good choice to make because it's gonna save money in the long run. One of the other things we can do here to help uh, improve the accuracy of our measurement is to add a transmitter and connect that to the RTD probe. And what that lets us do is actually to match the RTD characteristics to the transmitter, and that will eliminate a lot of the interchangeability error that we that we see from, from that just manufacturing the probe. What the manufacturers do is they'll calibrate the sensor, so they're actually characterizing the resistance versus the temperature it puts out They'll use that information to tailor the transmitter brain so that it, it knows exactly what temperature to output when it's getting a particular resistance input. Some of the other things a transmitter will help with is if you have a, a noisy area with radio frequency or electromagnetic interference, those that four to 20 milliamp signal from a transmitter going back to your control system is a lot more robust and you can run it longer distances, uh, less susceptible to those types of interference. So 
So um, there, I don't know if we have any other questions. Uh, yeah, it looks like we've got a, a question uh, again about the, you know, essentially, I guess, um, recommended outer diameter plus the set sensing element if if it's in a thermal well. Is there a kind of a formula for the, uh, you know, if you have a thermal well diameter as to how that uh, formula would work? You know, typically with a thermal well, uh, if you, it, it's really a balancing act between the immersion length and getting a good accurate measurement. The the rule of thumb there with, you know, you, you, I, I see lots of them. There might be where you want the thermal well to get to the center of the pipe, or it might be two thirds of the diameter, or uh, there's just a whole, there's many little rules of thumb out there. What what I find the best was if we go back to our, our this test data, you know, this is probably as good as any. Uh, this is a tapered thermal well. It's in a, you know, we tested it in an ice bath and 100 degrees C and 200 degrees C oil baths. And you get all about the same number. You can see all three lines on this graph are pretty close to the same result. And when we get down to about four inches of immersion, most of the error goes away. So we'd look at a thermal well like this one we'd want at least four inches of immersion to make sure that we get rid of a lot of that stem conduction error. There are other factors that come into play. Uh, if you have a, a fluid in the pipe that has oh, like a high fat content, for example, uh, that tends not to give up uh, its temperature quite as easily and you end up with a little more stem conduction and if you're trying to measure air temperature in a pipe, you need a lot more immersion length than what this graph shows. It, it might be, uh, you know, you might need, rather than four inches, you might need twice that, eight inches of immersion. It, it, it depends on the thermal properties of the fluid. Uh, it, most liquids, you, you'll be fine with at least four inches of immersion. So it, it's not a, I, I guess there's no real good little rule of thumb that's going to work for everything. You just have to be aware of some of the factors that can affect it, and then ask a lot of questions of the uh, your, your temperature supplier. Uh, they they should know what you know what a, what a good immersion length would be for a particular process fluid, and they can also do the wake frequency and strength calculation to make sure that you're not going to exceed those limits and cause a premature failure of the temperature probe and or the thermal well. Okay, and then there was a, another question about the download of slides, whether or not they were available. They are not available for download uh, right now. What we will do is we are recording this session and we will go ahead and post that session on our YouTube page, uh, which uh, can be searched on uh, YouTube, RTDology, and you'll be able to find uh, this presentation as well as several others. Uh, I Typically, you know, within the next uh, two or three days, uh, this recording will be will be posted up on uh, the YouTube site. Yeah, it'll take me about a day to process this and get it loaded up. It just it takes a little bit of time for the uh, upload to happen, so. Um, finally, we're looking at, uh, you know, I, again, this is going to be one of the more important ones. Price is always an issue, uh, no matter what we're doing. And if we look at some of these life cycle cost factors, you know, the initial cost is usually the lowest uh, part of, or the smallest part of the whole cost of that measurement point. Uh, and it, it, it's... I guess when you look at all these other factors that go into uh, at, or determining how much that point is going to cost, it it really doesn't pay to save, you know, fifty or a hundred dollars on a cheap sensor and a cheap installation, and, and you know, just throw something at it and hope it works okay. Uh, it, it's going to end up, you know, costing ten times whatever you saved in. In, in all these other factors, you know, the efficiency of your your uh, your your uh, system, whatever product that you're manufacturing, if you have 
uh, if it gets spoiled because of a bad measurement, uh, a cheap sensor might fail or, or again be inaccurate. Energy costs are always a huge expense. Downtime, having to send somebody out to troubleshoot and replace, calibrate, whatever. Uh, and then the overhead of keeping more inventory replacement parts. So uh, again, that initial cost uh, really should be a pretty minor concern when you're looking at choosing uh, an RTD for temperature measurement. Now we, we looked at the, uh, the application, what we were doing, we had to check out the environment. And we consider all these things and, and usually starting out with some really good high quality materials and things. And I'm kind of into sailing, so I, I, I picked old iron sides here as an example where they started out with good stuff. It's had a lot of maintenance over the years and the thing is still, still going. You can still sail it, um, still floating over on the east coast. Uh, I don't recall exactly where it is now. I think it's probably Boston, but uh, you know, if you do pick out good equipment to start with, uh, it just makes everything go a lot easier. Um, with the RTDs, you want to be able to calibrate these periodically just to track to see how their performance is going, make sure that the sensor still repeats within the interchangeability numbers and um, and if it needs to be recalibrated, in the case of a matched transmitter, we can you can redo that. And that's typically on a, like a 12-month scale. Uh, sometimes, uh, depending on the particular process, you might want to choose a longer time scale than that. Now, one of the things we had that 1.6 degree Fahrenheit number. Um, one of the ways that you can eliminate most of that would be to insulate the external parts of the sensor. And that would include, I'd probably just leave the connection head exposed, but you could put a sleeve of insulation around this area and maybe 12 inches on either side of the sensor. So you would go around the pipe 12 inches on either side, make sure all this is insulated. Um, if you can cover up the connection head, that works also. And you can actually see pretty quickly how this really affects the accuracy of the measurement. Um, if you have a process that's running such as this, and if you were just to put insulation over all that stuff, you'd see the temperature change within a couple minutes. And it would be, you know, you'd, you'd, it, it would happen that quickly. Um, the ambient conditions have that much of an effect on that temperature measurement. So the other things that we selected here, we have the factory mutual approval for the hazardous gas environment. Um, we talked about matching the transmitter to the sensor for better accuracy. So we've eliminated that uh, uh, interchangeability error, which in our case amounts to about Oh, roughly uh, eight tenths of a degree Fahrenheit. We picked a good quality sensor, so we've got low drift, um, vibration resistant. And we added the union here between the connection head and the well for ease of maintenance and recalibration. The thermal well, we picked a two and a half inch immersion because it fits into our well properly and it survives the, the uh, wake frequency strength calculations, uh, it passes that easily. Um, and again, the insulation. So that's uh, our, our choice for this particular application. And these are kind of all of the factors that you need to consider when you're selecting a RTD for this type of uh, temperature measurement. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to Jeff to talk about uh, if we have any more questions or anything. Yeah, um, if there if there are any questions, go ahead and type them into the Q&A section or, or the chat uh, section on your screen. We'll go ahead and get you an answer to to those. If, uh, you know, you don't have a, a question right now, but you, uh, you know, think of something later, um, we've got some contact information. Uh, I think it's probably on the next slide, Bill, maybe. Um, yep. 
yeah. and then uh, you can go ahead and, and call us at any time or, or shoot us an email, and we'll go ahead and uh, get you an answer. I know we had a, quite a bit of, of conversation around um, – uh, stem conduction air and, and immersion length, and it's always a trade-off kind of situation. So I think today's presentation was to really make you aware that this is this is an issue. And so when you're looking at selecting uh, a, a temperature sensor, you want to be sure to take that into account. Now, if you say, well, you know, I've got a you know, four inches, but I, I only have a two-inch pipe, how's that going to work? There's there's all kinds of, of trade-offs and ways by making the, the uh, uh, diameter smaller, by taking uh, using elbow wells. There's all types of different approaches that we have to, um, you know, essentially help overcome that issue. So just be aware that's something that you want to talk to with your with your sensor manufacturer if you're not able to put it in and uh, you know install it in the uh, quote unquote traditional manner. Uh, there are ways to to overcome those those types of errors. Yeah. So we all, Go ahead, I wanted to just mention, too, that we've got some more sessions coming up. One is on troubleshooting uh, and then talking about some of the testing and documentation where we look at calibration certificates, um, material certifications for thermal wells, and some of the other um, oh, thermal well tests that are available. I mean, there's x-ray, there's dipenetrant testing, and uh, there's, you know, probably 20 or different certifications or tests that can be done to thermal wells to ensure that they survive in your particular application. And then next, uh, well, I guess that's way out in September with the calibration and verification, we'll talk a little bit more about what affects the accuracy of the sensor and how we can verify that it's still working correctly. Okay. And again, the uh, all of these sessions are on the uh, uh, YouTube page, if you just search for RTDology on there, it'll come up with a whole list of these. And there's, a, in addition to the, the full hour long sessions, there are some that are about oh, five to 10 minutes. And I've just taken little excerpts out of each one of these, just kind of a, a real short thing on, for example, how to calibrate an RTD in an ice bath. So there's quite a few of those out there also. Okay, so there is the, the contact information if you do, uh, or I guess uh, some more information on, on temperature measurement. And I think, uh, I think Bill's, do you have your email address at the next, on the next slide? You know, unfortunately, oh, I did not put that on here for some reason. But <laughs> it's, right. um, um, if you, you, you can actually reach us easily if you just use info at burnsengineering.com. Um, that way you get exposed to all the applications engineers here, and we can get back to you uh, typically within a day. So. Okay. We do have a couple uh, couple questions, Bill. One is regarding insulation, uh, and their question is, are you recommending insulation around the external parts? Um, when you have a short immersion thermal well like we have in our example, absolutely. It, it really makes a big difference. If you have, if we had a like a six inch pipe here and we could use a thermal well that had at least a four inch immersion, then you probably wouldn't have to insulate around it. But it, it's uh, usually a pretty good idea to add the insulation. Okay, and then another question regarding temperature effects. Is it is the same true for extremely chilled or cold process pipes with external frost accumulation? Yeah, it's, whenever you have a, a difference in temperature between the fluid in the pipe and the ambient conditions, you're going to see the stem conduction. So in a cold process, uh, it's going to, and you've got, you know, just room temperature, it's going to read a little bit warmer than what that fluid actually is. Yeah, so it definitely, it works, it works both ways. So you need to be, need to be aware of it. And, um, you know, insulation is, is, you know, very seldom a bad thing. So, uh, if, you know, if you, if you, have concerns with it with the immersion, uh, go ahead and add that insulation. So with that, it uh, doesn't look like we have any other questions at, at this time, but again, if you do have something, feel free to contact us at info at burnsengineering.com and we'll get uh, get back to you with an answer and, and try to help you out with your temperature measurement question. Uh, so we thank you for joining us today. We would love to see you at, at future events. 
So with uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, and we're signing off from Chile, Minnesota. We'll uh, see you next time.